My name is Brad. If you haven't met me before, Brad Hubert, I'm the pastor here at Manifest. And I, I just want to tell you that by the time I was probably 13 or 14 years old, I already knew what I wanted to be when I grew up. It wasn't an astronaut, it wasn't a policeman, it wasn't a fireman, it wasn't a cowboy, it wasn't even a superhero. It was a ninja. <laughs> And I didn't want to just dress like a ninja. I didn't want to just pretend that I was a ninja. I wanted to be a ninja. I, when I was in grade nine, I was living in Edmonton, Alberta, going to Vernon Barford Junior High. And there's a kid in the school that claimed to be taking ninjutsu from a ninja master. I kid you not. So we were like rolling our eyes. There's no way these kids like taking ninjutsu from a ninja master. So we're like, ooh, ninja, you know, like that whole thing. Secretly jealous because we wanted to be a ninja. And so one day we had pushed this kid just too far. We, we, finally we just said like, prove it. Because he'd say, no, I seriously, like on every Tuesday night, I go and I, whatever, right? And like, yeah, at Vernon Barford, there's a ninja in Edmonton, Alberta, uh-huh. And so, so finally he, he had enough. And he just said, fine, I'll prove it to you. And so one of our other buddies named Gary was walking by, and he's holding books in, in both arms. And, and this kid just walks in front of Gary, and just about like this, just goes, Bop, just about that hard, right here somewhere. And Gary's arms go, Bop, 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 and the books fall to the floor, and he can't lift his arms for 15 or 20 seconds. And we're like, that is the coolest thing ever. So we quickly interview Gary, you know, how does it feel? And he says, pain. <laughs> We're like, sweet, you'll be fine. And it's so, it, it's uh, after that experience, I decided I gotta, I gotta know more. I have to know more. So I actually found a book. I can't remember. I was gonna say online, but there was no online. There was, there was just that was in my brain. But uh, I found a book. I think at a bookstore somewhere it must have been, or I saw it in a comic book that you could order it or something. But there's a book called Secrets of the Ninja by Ashida Kim. This guy appears to be legit. I, and there's, there's this book, this book has all kinds of amazing things in it, like how to cervically dislocate your enemy's head from his spinal column in one simple blow, which is less applicable to my situation. So I, 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 was, I spent most of the time looking at, at one or two chapters that unpack the secret or the art of invisibility. I thought that was the coolest thing, that ninjas could just vanish in a puff of smoke. So in this book, he actually does some science. He, he actually unpacks how the human eye works. Did you know that our eyes notice movement first, silhouette or shape second, and color third? And so what a ninja would do is they would learn the art of moving in such a way that you couldn't de detect their movement. And they would wear baggy clothing that they could distort in the shadows so that you couldn't discern their shape. And then they would wear black that would blend into the shadows so you couldn't see their color, rendering them effectively invisible, even though they could be standing right in front of you before they kill you. So <laughs> this, was, this was fascinating to me. Fascinating, not the killing, sorry. The back it up, back the truck up. We're in church, shame on you. Come on, people. So, but you know what? what I, based on this kind of concept, and, and as it's, I walk through life with this, and it actually works, right, that this idea. But I came up with this, this idea, and I'm going to test it with you today. And it's actually, the, the idea is something that the, the series is kind of based on, that we're going to tackle the next five weeks. And it's this, this concept. There are no invisible things. There is only limited vision. <laughs> You're like, I don't believe that. Okay, that's okay. Just, uh, just nod and smile. It's dark. We won't know. So there are no invisible things, only limited vision. Now, of course, pop culture has known this and it's been exploring this for decades. This is where the X-Files comes from, that there are conspiracies that we cannot discern, that there's a spiritual realm. You know, the supernatural show that came out. And of course, recently, as our family's been enjoying this, this the show on Netflix, if you haven't caught it, you're welcome. Now you can see it called Stranger Things, which is based on the idea that there's this alternate dimension, the upside down, just beyond the veil of our senses. And it, it wreaks all kinds of trouble because there's a ripple effect between the two realms. And if by now you're going, ugh, and rolling your eyes, Brad's going off in his sci-fi 
binging again, uh, just, just let me remind you that our world and your world, whether you are a sci-fi or fantasy person or not, is built on things you cannot see. All of us, our worlds are built on things we cannot see. Germs. I know some of you think you can see germs, but no. There, <laughs> there's germs! But, but uh, atoms? Can you see atoms? Nobody can see atoms, actually. Radio waves? Gravity? Love? Donald Trump's tax returns? <laughs> These are things we may never see with the naked eye. But they exist. Oh yes, they exist. Couldn't resist that one. The fact is, the fact is that the vast majority of the things in your life you think you know, you only believe. The vast majority. I know, okay, I'll move on. There we go. It's like, I gotta get caught straight. Get Donald, get the Donald off the screen. So seriously, the vast majority of what you think you know, you only believe. You, you think you know, but it's because someone told you it's so. There are very few things in your life that are actual facts that you have observed and tasted and touched and verified for yourself. We know precious little, and the rest we fill in by imagination. We really do. Now, the word imagination kind of gets a, a bad rap. You know, it's, it's kind of one of those words you relegate to artists and, and some musicians maybe, fairy tales, fantasy, make-believe, right? When something's imaginary, you kind of roll your eyes. This is, imagination is kind of, it's kind of the property of the young and the children. And it's the thing that you have when you're younger that you're supposed to outgrow when you grow up and live in the real world, right? This is something that we think. Now, I just want to blow your mind. There, there's, a, there's a guy that, that has a much more interesting face that, than Donald Trump that you may have heard of before, Albert Einstein, who said, logic will take you from A to B. Imagination will take you anywhere. Coming from one of the smartest humans to ever walk the planet, that's an interesting statement, is it not? Very interesting statement. Now, the, the word imagine probably has two sides to the coin. We're going to talk about imagination because when it comes to realms that we cannot see and augmented reality, imagination is a big part of this. But there are two senses of the word. One is the one we're most familiar with, which is making stuff up, right? This is, you can tell I got that right from the dictionary. <laughs> the Brad Hebrew Dictionary. Making stuff up. That's the first sense of the word. The second sense of the word, though, is really interesting to me. And that is one we don't often consider. It's the ability to visualize things not present to the senses. Now, uh, Tom, would you please stand? <laughs> For public humiliation. No. Okay. So what I'd like you to do is I'll get a good look at Tom. I'm sorry, Shauna, for what I'm about to do. Uh, now, I want you to imagine Tom wearing a tutu. <laughs> You're like, I don't want to imagine Tom. I don't either. But now it's done, <laughs> and we will never see the same again. <laughs> what was that? You don't have to imagine. <laughs> this happened. <laughs> uh, we, uh, so, thank you, Tom. You can be seated. Now, obviously, obviously, this is the first sense of the word imagine. I'm making stuff up because I know for a fact that Tom does not wear a tutu in public. So, <laughs> you, can't, you can't see that now. So, the, the, the thing is, though, okay, we're going to try the second part of the exercise. And that is, how many of you, don't look, don't turn around, look, look here, okay? How many of you saw the coffee station coming in? Okay, can you picture it in your mind? It's got those green Starbucks things with coffee and tea and all that kind of stuff. Here's the question. What you're seeing in your mind, is that real or fantasy? It's real in the sense that it exists. You're not making it up. It's there. 
It's just not present to your senses. So there are two clear sense, or kind of sides of the coin when it comes to imagination. The I irony is that good science actually uses both of these definitions. Not even shoddy science, good science. Good science makes stuff up, a hypothesis, what if? What if this were true? What if that were true? And then you engage in a bunch of tests to see if it's true or if you can just prove it, right? That's, a, that's what a hypothesis is, making something up and seeing if it sticks. And then good science also depicts what it finds out, what it disproves or proves. In other words, have you ever seen an atom? No, no one's ever seen an atom, and yet you have seen an atom in every science textbook. You see a model of the atom with the double helix. Did you know that's imaginary? In the sense that no one's ever seen it. It's a theory. This is the best depiction of what an atom probably is like based on what they know, but what they're doing is they're visualizing something that is actually not present to the senses. So again, when you're talking about imagination, we cannot just relegate it to a child's plaything. This is fundamental to what it means to be human and actually to grow as a person. All right, now what I want to, what I want to show you is, in fact, Einstein would want to step further. He would even say this, the sign of true intelligence is not knowledge, but imagination. Because knowledge, by definition, locks you into what you already know. Unless you can imagine something that isn't, you can never go beyond the boundaries of where you are. So this is, this is why someone like Einstein, who is a genius and probably had more knowledge than I ever will, would actually say, no, but imagination is the most important thing. Now, what I want to tell you today is that faith is exactly the same. In other words, a vibrant faith is actually dependent on an active and healthy imagination. Now, if you're not a believer in Jesus, you're going to go, here it is, this is what I, I told you. The Bible's a fairy tale, and people are just imagining these encounters with God. And, but I just showed you that imagination isn't just imaginary. So I want to tell you that a healthy, vibrant faith is dependent on a healthy, vibrant imagination. I'm going to show you how. And, and understanding this can unlock faith for you in a way that you have probably never experienced. Now, obviously, you're going to say, well, it doesn't apply to the first sense of the word, making stuff up. Well, it kind of does. And here's what I mean. How did Jesus plant this church? How did it start? Where did God start? He started by planting a seed, a vision, in here, in here in my heart, in my mind, and it, he started to paint a picture that became more and more real that I started to share with other people, and Shauna and I started sharing it, and other people began to catch the vision, and the chairs you're sitting on, the video you're watching, the coffee you're drinking, the, the experience you're having was made up for, by imagination as our faith was caught, like ignited by God's Spirit, and he brought real things to life through what he, we painted in our mind's eye. So in a sense, yes, faith makes stuff up. Now, you're going to say, well, this is exactly, again, what I was telling you, that it's just all made up. No, because you'll notice in that story, I didn't start with myself. The idea came from outside of me, into me, which means there's something tangible, even though we can't see it. Uh, Hebrews 11 verse 1, or I didn't get you this verse. Hebrews 11 verse 1 is, is a, a beautiful chapter in the Bible. If you grew up in church, you know what this chapter is. It's called the faith chapter, and there's a reason. It starts, verse 1, it starts with what we would have, or we would call the closest definition to faith we're going to get in the whole Bible. And it's this, and this is from a, a version of the Bible called the New King James. It says this, faith is the substance of things hoped for. That's the first word, substance. The second is the evidence of things not seen. That word substance. In other words, the reason you're here this morning is that God breathed through the imagination of a team of people and he used that faith, that imaginative capacity of faith, 
as the raw materials that he used to manifest, manifest. Do you see that? That's how it started. That's the substance of things not seen. But this evidence word is interesting. One of the reasons you don't see things is because they haven't happened yet sometimes. So here's, here's this writer saying faith is the evidence of something you haven't seen yet. So in other words, the evidence comes before the fact. The cart comes before the horse. Isn't that wild? It's so cool. So again, if it's evidence, there must be something it's pointing to. And again, even if it's something that is real and exists just like here, you can't see it, but there are angels all around us. There, there are demonic forces vying for our attention. There's a God that is present and moving through this room right now. You can't see it, but the, we talked about this, we sang about it, the evidence is all around, not just in tangible things, but in the faith that is inspired by the object. Faith is the proof that something is inspiring it, in other words. So in other words, this is not just in our heads. This is outside of us, moving inside of us. I mentioned that there are no invisible things, only limited vision. If I can't see far enough, and I want to see something farther than I can see, it's not technically invisible, I just can't see that far. And by using a lens called a telescope, I can now see it. If I, if I want to look at something like, a, speaking of germs, the germs that I've hacked onto my, my notes here because I spit when I talk, I don't need a microscope to see what is absolutely visible, just not with the limitations of these eyes. When you're blurry to me and I put these glasses on and everything comes into focus, that's the power of a lens. And faith is the God-given lens that brings the near far, it makes the big small, it makes the small big, it makes the fuzzy clear, and it turns the invisible visible. That's what faith is. That's what it does. And in the hallway there, many of you are experimenting with augmented reality and, you know, the whole Pokemon Go thing. You're like, oh, fine, I'll do it at the church. You know, you're walking around and you're like, okay, that's pretty cool. <laughs> but no one's looking. Okay, so you're, you're experimenting with augmented reality. Faith doesn't augment reality. Faith augments our perception of reality. It's there or not, whether we see it or not. It's just that faith gives us the eyes to see what we could not see before. Hebrews 11, this chapter continues on and it, it unpacks this idea that faith is not blind. It's just a different kind of seeing. If you don't grasp that, God will not be real to you. Look at this chapter and look at these verses. By faith, if you've heard of Moses, Moses and the Ten Commandments, that dude, that's all you need to know right now. By faith, Moses' parents, when they were living in Egypt, hid him for three months after he was born. Watch this. Because they saw he was no ordinary child. Now, he didn't have wings sprouting out the back. He didn't have like superpowers, cyclops things going on. He, they just, they looked at this perfectly normal looking child and saw the extraordinary. How? It says, by faith, through that lens, they were able to see this is not a normal kid. There's something special about this kid. And because of that, they weren't afraid of the king's edict when he tried to persecute all the children and all that. By faith, Moses, that same kid, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, because he's straddling both worlds, right? He's brought into the Pharaoh's palace. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as greater value than the treasures of Egypt. Watch, because he was looking ahead to his reward. So in the middle of all of his struggles, yes, the struggle was real, the persecution was real, the hardship was real, but he saw something other people didn't see. He saw his reward waiting for him on the other side of the tunnel, and he persevered. Look at this, kept going. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger, and he persevered. One of my favorite lines in the whole Bible, because he saw him who is invisible. 
by faith. Here's a question for you. Does God seem real to you? If he doesn't, I bet you anything, you need to learn to engage your imagination in the process of relating to him. Husbands and wives do this all the time. You get a call during the day from your honey, and you're picturing her, or you're picturing him. What are you doing right now? Oh, yeah, yeah. And you can see it in your mind. That's part of what brings that conversation to life. You can see the person you're talking to. You can feel the person you're talking to, even though they're not present to your senses. Somehow, by faith, he was able to see him who is invisible. As God breathes through our imagination, he fills it with the imagery of faith, with, with things that represent those invisible realities we can't see with our eyes, and it brings a vividness to our experience that you cannot get any other way. When uh, our family <laughs> had a crisis this summer with our son Joel, this became huge for me. For those of you that don't know our, our son Joel, while we were in Winnipeg uh, visiting my folks and, and uh, Shauna's folks, we, we were out at St. Patel Park and Joel was skateboarding and, and he wiped out and smacked his head on the cement and out cold, had a seizure, and I mean, we called the EMS right away. And in, in that moment, as he was lying there on the cement, even after the seizure, he couldn't form words. There were moments where his legs weren't working. I mean, it was, it was terrifying. He, he was there, and, and we, we had a moment, Sean and I, where we thought, have we lost him? Like, not that he's gonna die, but have we lost the son that we know? Is his personality ever gonna be the same? We just didn't know. So the EMS came and, and picked Joel up and, and you know, put him on a board and, and Shauna went in the ambulance and I ran home to my parents' place to get our vehicle to rush to the children's hospital to meet them there. Got halfway to the hospital and realized I'd forgotten my wallet because I was, just wasn't thinking. So I couldn't park without my wallet. So I had to rush all the way back. And as I'm praying, I'm in a battle because I'm despairing, I'm, I'm freaked out, I'm wondering what, what to do, and I cry out to the invisible God. And I said, God, I need to see your perspective on this. Because from my perspective, this does not look good. God, what is going on? And I, I just sensed so clearly into my spirit, the Father spoke these words, Joel is going to be okay. And I realized in that moment, I've told some of you this story, God's okay and my okay may not be the same thing, but I know my God and I know my Father and I'm trusting His heart. I'm going with that. I'm not going with the cartwheeling into despair. So I let go of that and I chose to hang on to what I could not see with my eyes, but I could now see in my heart and with my faith. My son is going to be okay. So we got back to we got to the hospital and, and there he is and he's strapped down and he's he's panicking and freaking out because he's starting to become more lucid and conscious, still can't talk really. The, the sight of him there on the bed, you can just about imagine, sends a spike like of, of fear through you. And and he's there. It's not faith isn't denying. Faith isn't going, he's not hurt. Faith says he's hurt bad. But my daddy said. He's going to be okay. So then the CT results come back. And, and he's got a cracked, a fractured skull. And there's bleeding on his brain. And it, I, again, it's not denial. Going, no, 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 that's not real. It's not true. La, 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 la. No, it's saying, I, I accept that. That is real. But my daddy said he's going to be okay. And all of my prayers and all of my focus go into that. And whenever I feel the temptation to go down a different path, a sense God saying, you stick with me. No one in this moment would fault you for going down a path and worrying and despairing and going into the cesspool, of, you know, back and forth, back and forth of doubt. No one would fault you for that, but you really, really, really need to live here now for his sake and for everybody's sake around you. It was not, was not easy, but Joel is here today. Joel is speaking just fine. He's going to school. He's starting to exercise. He's, he's like, if you didn't know him terribly well, you wouldn't even know he has a concussion. It's awesome. It's fantastic. 
That's, 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 the, that's God keeping his promise. Now, just two days ago now, we had a follow-up appointment. And uh, because some of the records that didn't come through, we, uh, the doctors decided before they released him to physical activity, because he's doing so well, right, that, that they were going to take a, a CT scan again just to make sure what was going on. And here's the scan. You get to see it. And that red line is the crack that still is there in his skull. We had no idea it was that big. And, and we found out, we found out that this, the bone part hasn't even started to knit. It hasn't even started to heal. It's about a month or five weeks in. So there it is, folks. But my daddy said he's going to be okay. There's no way his brain should be in this shape with, with that kind of injury this quick. So I already know my daddy's been at work. He's already kept his promise. And so now I'm just going to ask you to join us in praying that that bone knits together. And regardless, he's going to be okay. See, because I have my gaze fixed on something that is not present to my senses. This is the battle for each one of us. Again, faith is not blind. It's a different kind of seeing. We all live by faith. Whether you believe the Bible is God's word or not, whether you believe in God at all, you live by faith. Most of what you take as fact, you have been fed and you believe it. You don't know it. You believe it and you fill in the gaps by imagination. The question is, is our imagination anchored and rooted in ultimate reality or is it a figment of our imagination? The writers of the Bible make the audacious claim, not in one place, but throughout, this is the common message, that fixing our eyes on what is unseen, fixing our eyes on the God who is invisible, is more grounded in reality than fixing our eyes on what we can see. That's the message. Now, if our, if our faith, because we all have it, if our faith is grounded in here, that is a dangerous thing. If our imagination is just, it's just stuff that we make up, and it is just imaginary, and it is fantasy, we are dangerous people on dangerous ground. But if our imagination has been captured by the invisible God who's painting pictures on our minds, it's one of the most powerful faculties we have. I don't have a Bible up here because I've got the, the scriptures right here that I'm reading, but that Bible that you own, I hope you have a Bible. If you don't, we'll give you one before you leave. That Bible that you own, beyond all of the stories and all the morality tales, Beyond all of the, the how-tos and the do's and the don'ts and everything else you can find sprinkled throughout those pages, throughout all the history and all of that, the central purpose of the Bible is to teach you to see. In particular, to see the Son of God, Jesus, and that all of history has been winding down and focused on Him and then winding up through Him. That's the purpose of this book. So the, this book, the Bible, is full of images and stories and pictures and metaphors that are designed to engage your imagination. We're going to take the next couple of weeks to learn again together how to see, based on what the Bible says, reality is actually like. So the, for example, there's a, there's a verse that, where Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Most Christians I know just go, that's a good word, good word, that's so good, awesome. <laughs> Vine, branches. No, you're missing the point. He's, he's using a picture because he wants to engage your imagination. He wants you to see it. So here I am. I had this moment. I am holding my son on, this, on the pavement, waiting for EMS. Having this, this line again between despair and, and faith. And I have this moment where I choose faith. 
And they say, God, thank you that you are the vine and I am a branch in the vine, which makes me connected to the source of all life and power. And I'm choosing to see this. And so I actually see in my spirit that I'm connected to this life and the sap of the vine is moving in me and through me and it's coming out of me and I can influence the, this moment by being present and exercising the faith that God has for me to exercise. That is real, that is not imaginary. When, when Jesus says, my spirit within you is like, a, it's like a spring of living water coming up from your deepest places, he doesn't mean for you to go, oh, that's nice. He wants you to picture it, those moments when you're empty, when you're feeling alone, you just imagine, Jesus, you told me that your spirit is in me. It's like a spring of living water. You just watch the spring in your sight, in your mind's eye, growing, filling you, completing you, rushing out of you till you have more than you need and you can give it away. That's what he's wanting you to see. This is how to see. This series, I'm praying that God unleashes, captures our imagination and helps us to experience God, but then also in, in such a way that we can share him with others. Grounded in the truth of who God's word says he is. Found this quote this week, and I thought I'd close with this. It's amazing. Imagination grows by exercise. And contrary to common belief, is more powerful in the mature than the young. As we sing this next song, that is full of imagery, I'm challenging you, even if you need to close your eyes, do it, but go there. Don't just say the words. Let the images that are actually quite biblical, images in the song, Inspire your imagination and see it. See yourself in the song. See yourself being called out on the waters by Jesus and following him. In fact, if you're here today and you've never put your faith in Christ and something in your mind is going, you know what, this is what I want. This is what I need. I need to explore this. I'm challenging you today to pray this prayer with me. Would you pray? And even if you are a believer, just pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you that you died for my sins on the cross, that you are my savior. Jesus, thank you that you rose from the dead and conquered death and hell, that you're my Lord. Thank you that you sent your spirit to live inside of me and fill me and complete me. Complete me. You are my life. Thank you that you've gone to prepare a place for me. You're my destiny. In Jesus' name, amen.